when you grow up, you tend to get told that the world is the way it is, and your, your life is just to live your life inside the world, try not to bash into the walls too much, uh, uh, try to have a nice family life, uh, have fun, save a little money. Um, but life, th that's a very limited life. Life can be much broader once you discover one simple fact, and that is everything around you that you call life was made up by people that were no smarter than you. You can build your own things that other people can use. And the minute that you understand that you can poke life and actually something will, you know, if you push in, something will pop out the other side, that you can, you can change it, you can mold it, that's maybe the most important thing, is to shake off this, uh, th this uh, erroneous notion that life is, is there and you're just going to live in it versus embrace it, change it, improve it, make your mark upon it. Once you learn that, you'll never be the same again. They say it's gone away, it won't be back again. It's everything, it's visual, it's sensual. If only for a day, to prove it's not the end. It is late November in North Brookfield, Massachusetts, and local carpenter Jeff Samuelson is adding the finishing touches to the exterior of the town's townhouse. He does this to prepare the top of the building for the reinstallment of the building's bell tower before winter sets in. In some of the final work he must do in preparing the building, Jeff must complete the copper flat roof using a lock panel roof system. This involves a process called pre-tinning, seen here, in which panels are first dipped into a trough of molten solder, nailed to the roof, interlocked and soldered together. It makes it a lot easier when you're welding it with the solder to make sure that you have full contact and uh, that roof uh, should last 150 years. I, I didn't want to uh, spare any expense as far as time or labor. It's the best system for that. It, it, the ultraviolet rays won't have any impact on it and the water won't have any impact on it. It worked out very well. Once his work is completed, Jeff will begin to shift his focus towards working on the bell tower which has been sitting in his driveway since mid-2013. This will give Samuelson the winter to work on the tower before returning it to the townhouse come spring. As late November bleeds into early December, Pressure begins to set in to complete the tower before its spring deadline. Too cold to continue work in the building, Jeff must shift his attention to his own driveway, where a half-completed bell tower has been sitting for several months. In order to continue work on the tower, he must place the current structure on a highly elevated staging. He does this via a crane, which lifts the tower using a hook at its peak, then places it onto a nearby platform.
An historic milestone in the development of the tower, dozens of local residents pour out to witness the act take place. However, once the structure is securely on the platform, Samuelson waits before performing ample work on the lower half. Instead, he focuses his work on building one of the tower's most prominent assets, the gold-plated finial. Early on, Jeff expressed great excitement for the installment of the new finial. In my mind, I just want to get it down the bag. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Made out of several scrap pieces of Corian countertop, the new finial will contain several newspaper clippings and pictures involving the construction of the tower in its base. After only a week of work, the new finial is almost complete. In the process seen here, a piece of Corian belonging to the structure's base is heated in a toaster oven, then bent to match the curve of the base. Uh, when it came time to make the base of the finial, it was, uh, it was a good challenge and uh, I like uh, you know, a good challenge when it comes time to make things. So I, and I, I've never done it before, it's just kind of a lot of the procedures are just, you just uh, dream them up as you go. So, I made the decision that I, I couldn't cook it the same way as I was uh, doing the PVC. So I decided to put it in a toaster oven, the, the small pieces, and then clamp it together so that uh, I could get one, each one of the eight sides. It had to be exactly the same. Close is not going to be acceptable. And it's the, the finial itself is another uh, identical reproduction of the first one. And in fact, the top piece, just to make that one piece, took all day. Um, and, uh, but it was fun. It, it was a lot of fun to make that. Once the top of the finial is attached and the structure complete, the finial must then be sanded and painted in a yellow burnishing sealer. Finally, the delicate process of applying the gold leaf begins. Jeff's work begins early on a clear Tuesday morning. He starts by coating the entire finial in an oil-based sizing for the gold leaf to stick to. Its application takes roughly an hour to complete. Uh, it's sprayed with, uh, I use a slow set gilding size. This is an oil, um, and I'm pretty sure the stuff hasn't changed in thousands of years. Um, you know, the, the procedure to apply it. It it gets to a point where it's it's sticky like a lollipop. And if you could imagine taking that lollipop and putting it into your campfire, uh, into the ashes, every single part of that lollipop will take some of the ash and then you can brush it off. However, the leaf can't be applied just yet. It will take six to eight hours for the base to dry before anything can be applied to it. By noon, the finial is dry. he begins to apply the leaf. At half of a micron thick and only 3.5 inches wide, the gold leaf is extremely fragile, 
yet is expected to last for the next 30 to 40 years atop the tower. That's not it. You put in staying a white t-shirt with this. Um, it, it's so thin, it's, it's almost not even there. He works with intense concentration. It's a little piece of gold and uh, every part that's sticky, of course the whole thing is sticky, will take that gold and it's so thin when you overlap it you can't see the seams. So then it's, it's brushed off, this is a brush made from squirrel hair, and it's brushed off all the flakes and uh, they, of course they, the flakes end up on the ground and everybody thinks, aren't you going to keep it? Well you can't touch it. Um, a piece the size of a quarter couldn't stain a white t-shirt. Once it's covered with that gold, uh, like I said, the, the ultraviolet rays will have no impact on it, but years of wind abrasion will slowly take it off. Four hours later, the process is complete. The once yellow varnished finial now appears to be made of solid gold, like magic. Over the next few months, Jeff works diligently to complete the tower. With the lower tower in place, he strives to achieve perfect resemblance to the original tower, now sitting only a few feet away from the replica on his front lawn. In a previous interview, Jeff had explained when he imagined the bell and the tower would go up. I think um, it's definitely going up in the spring. The bell will definitely go up, uh, I would say in November. Jeff's prediction had come true, for the most part. The bell was supposed to go up in uh, the fall, uh, but at that time I was so busy, that was I was anticipating putting it up in the, the fall. But, we were so busy that uh, I just didn't have the time. A friend of mine, Jeff Nickerson, had it sandblasted and then it was powder coated. Uh, and I just didn't have the time to, to put it up then. And I also wanted to uh, save the money because I'd have to hire a crane just uh, for that lift. So I made the decision to wait until the day the tower went up that uh, you know, put the bell up at the same time. The town also urges Jeff to consider a date in June to install the tower. However, due to previously contracted work, Jeff cannot wait that long. It is decided the tower will go up on May 18th at 9 o'clock a.m. In the weeks leading up to the historic event, Jeff devotes himself solely to his work. He recruits the help of friend Howard Whitcomb to paint the lower half of the tower while he works towards stabilizing the structure as a whole. The Thursday prior to the raising of the tower, a crane will come to his house to place the entire tower on its side and escort it downtown, an event Jeff has been anticipating and dreading for months. If the slightest problem should occur, then he loses it all. Three years of progress are suddenly in vain. But Jeff is determined to make sure that doesn't happen. After weeks of finalizing and bulletproofing the tower, Jeff finally takes a night to unwind, lighting up a cigar and admiring his creation. Finally, the day comes, moving day. A crane arrives at the Samuelson household in early morning. They know a long morning is ahead of them. As noise of the commotion spreads, spectators begin to pour out of their households and cars begin cluttering the streets. Yet while excitement surrounding the event starts to grow, excitement is the last thing on Jeff's mind. No, he is far too concerned with the event's execution. 
making sure he does not lose that which he has worked so long and so hard for. Finally, the time had come to move it from my house uh, to the townhouse and you know I, I was extremely anxious about it because you have so much at stake and the smallest problem is the biggest problem and I have you know business liability oh, but I just thought to myself I'm sure it covers everything but this so I was very anxious about it um, that was uh, that was kind of unhealthy stress. The process begins by connecting two hollowed out truck wheels via a large block of wood located in the top of the tower. Next, the crane lowers two loose slings that are placed around the wheels. Once the structure is off the ground, a cord is attached connecting the bottom of the tower to the bucket of a front end loader. The crane lowers the tower while the front end loader raises its bucket, thus rotating the tower and placing it on its side. Cords are then attached via hooks on both ends of the tower in order to lift it to be placed on the flatbed. The crew spends roughly an hour ensuring the structure is well secured before lifting the bell onto the flatbed, as well as some weights for extra precaution. The tower then makes its maiden voyage to its new home, the North Brookfield Townhouse. Jeff rides in the back with the tower as his friends walk alongside the truck, lifting electrical wires and ensuring that trees are kept out of the way of the 13-foot wide tower. Moving at less than 2 miles per hour, it takes the tower nearly an hour to arrive at the townhouse less than a mile away. It went just as I planned. Um, and it was my first time, but when you put uh, something that size, on its side and uh, you have to transport it, it's not that ideal. After it was uh, delivered downtown, I slept like a baby that night. The tower arrives safely. The next time it will be seen by many will be atop the townhouse. It is a clear morning, the morning of May 18th, 2014, 7 o'clock a.m. The absence of sunlight casts cold shadows upon the few spectators who have already begun to gather in the streets below. The press is surprisingly absent from the event. Roughly only 200 people will turn up to watch the installation of the tower, yet despite the rather small viewing audience, the events that will unfold within the next four hours will prove to be some of the most historic in the town's history. The first step, restoring the bell to the top of the building. The shortest procedure of the day, the raising of the bell takes only a few minutes to complete. Similar to when it was removed in 2011, Jeff once again rings the bell a number of times, only this time with a purpose. The first time I'm going to ring this bell 
is for Seamus O'Toole, who died last week in a car accident. And he was a friend of mine, and he was a real friend. So I'd like to ring the bell in his honor right now. Seamus was 21 years old when he died. Throughout the town's history, if a resident were to die, the bell would ring, each ring representing one year of the person's life. In honour of tradition, Jeff rings the bell 21 times. Seamus is looking from above, and I wish it would ring more than 21 times. After the final ring, Jeff is soon faced with his next task, placing the tower back into an upright position. This is done in a manner similar to that in which the tower was placed on its side. Cords are connected to the two ends of the structure, which are connected respectively to two separate cranes. As one raises one end of the tower, the other lowers the opposing end, thus, once again, bringing the entire structure to a vertical position. Upright, the tower now stands at 37 feet high. Now comes the main event of the day's festivities, a moment hundreds had been looking forward to for months. A piece of history three years in the making. The last time anyone had seen the bell tower perched upon the North Brookfield Town Hall was the year 2011, before wind and rain tore it from the building. The tower had never been well equipped to handle such extreme conditions. One of the last standing testaments to the heyday of the small town, the bell tower had long acted as the face of North Brookfield, and with its three-year absence, the town had begun to lose its identity. A hole was left that no alternative could seem to fill. Now, over a hundred years after the construction of the original tower, the townhouse is being given another chance at life. You ready? At exactly 10 past 10 a.m., the ascent begins. This time, the tower is lifted not by two slings, but by a single cord running through its center. If something is to go wrong, it would be now. Tension plagues the air. Everybody holds their breath, except Jeff's wife? Meet Robin Lee Samuelson, Jeff Samuelson's biggest fan. I think it was early on when I met Jeff um, that I realized that I really didn't have to worry about him going up in high places. He has a passion for it, it excites him, but and it's thrilling for him, but he He's very careful, he certainly doesn't want to hurt himself, so he's made me comfortable pretty early on. The tower finally makes its way to the top of the building. It went smooth and as soon as it was vertical and hanging in there and I was cutting the templates off, uh, I knew that uh, it was going to go up there and I knew it was going to fit. Templates don't lie. And uh, before I started to lift it up, lift up the towel before the crane pulled it up, what I did is I packed the front with lead uh, so that as it was coming down onto the base, I wanted, I threaded it through with the cables, uh, and uh, I wanted those front two feet to touch first no matter what. It didn't matter if it was a half an inch first or you know, a full inch first, but as it was coming down, those. Uh, front legs touched first and it has some shoe horns so that as it came in and uh, it, it lined up perfectly and bolted it on. Uh... 
cheers and applause erupt from the ground below. Yet Jeff cannot relax just yet. He knows his work is not complete. The tower is missing something. Something that he knew could only be attached after the tower was atop the building. The tower is missing its gold-plated finial. In order to install the piece, Jeff must be lifted nearly 90 feet into the air and glue it to the top of the building. Only then will the day be done. When it came time to do the finial for the very top, um, I treated it like it was a piece of jewelry. It was more than just a piece of carpentry for me uh, to make this and to gild it. Seeing Jeff being lifted up in the basket, going as high as the, the uh, machine would take him, was very exciting for me because I know how much he enjoys that. I don't get nervous. I learned a long time ago not to be nervous um, because he's safe and enjoys what he does and certainly doesn't want to get hurt. It shines, nothing glitters like gold. I'm really proud of it and that was probably one of the finest pieces that I've ever made. I, I've made a lot of nice stuff and that was the funnest and uh, it's for everybody to enjoy which is even better. Because it's, uh, it's worth nothing if it's in my shop or in my house. Everybody can enjoy it for years to come. I'd like you all to know that the gold leaf on this finial was donated from the Lane family. I see you. <laughs> so when you look at this, you can think of John Lane, because I know I will. After successfully installing the finial, Jeff is lifted an additional 40 feet to obtain a bird's eye view of his work. He takes several pictures with his iPhone to show to family and friends upon his return to the ground. During his descent, Jeff removes excess wood from the side of the building. After only a few minutes, he returns to the ground, only to be greeted by applause and handshakes. the town. Uh, it is the town's identity um, and it reflects on property values and it reflects on the people that live here so it, uh, I'm happy that it's up there. It, it really it belongs up there. The long-awaited day has proved to be a success. Although the bell tower may have reached the end of its journey, Jeff's journey is far from over. In the weeks following the installation of the tower, news stories begin to surface covering the event, even catching the attention of Fox News, who decides to feature Jeff in a one-on-one -on -one interview during a local news segment. We have people like my next guest in order to make it a very unique place. Jeff Samuelson is here. He's a local carpenter, uh, and he's been involved in an incredible project, restoring the damaged bell tower from the 150-year-old North Brookfield townhouse. And Jeff's taking guys like you that make communities like this important and, and making that happen and people see around town they may not remember his name but they'll say you know what his face rings a bell today Jeff still visits the top of the townhouse 
where he continues to add wall panels, railings and spindles to the tower. Although Jeff claims his life has indeed become simpler since the tower left his driveway. He continues to balance his work on the tower with his work as a local Massachusetts carpenter, taking on projects of a much smaller scale. He spends his time working on kitchens and bathrooms, as well as building interiors and exteriors for those who require his assistance. Yet, being one of his most ambitious endeavours thus far, the North Brookfield Bell Tower will always be with him. It was, it was definitely, yeah, I would say it was the longest project I've done, but part of it, and I knew it right in the very beginning that I, I liked so much, um, is when you start with a chainsaw, uh, cutting the structure out from inside, and then, you know, I came back to my house and I'm using a very big sledgehammer to you know, position boards and ultimately end up using a brush made from squirrel hair. Um, I really like that because I got to do uh, a lot of everything. But look at the rest of the building and it's in very tough shape and uh, you know I fantasize about wow as soon as I get this up you know I'll slide my staging over to the other uh, things that are in desperate need of work um, very badly. And I just it's uh, in almost three years and and nothing has gone forward yet and uh, just it, it has to get done soon uh, time is of the essence and I, it, I'm just disappointed I don't, I don't have any moved grass but I'm disappointed that nothing has gone forward since I started but who knows who knows what happens the work the craftsmanship the undeniable love that was poured into the building has now become an irreplaceable piece of Jeff's own history. Through the trials and tribulations, the rain and the sun, the pain and the relief, he built what the rest of us could not, a piece of living history. His legacy will live for years to come atop the North Brookfield townhouse, a building that will forever headline his resume. So the next time you visit the small town of North Brookfield and you see the light fall gently upon the gold-plated tip of its townhouse, remember the events that placed it there. Remember the pain, the passion, the triumphs and the strides. Remember the work of one seemingly ordinary carpenter who managed the extraordinary. Remember Jeff Samuelson. It was, it was the best project of my life. This is a house that the people who came from North Brookfield built, and it is our responsibility. All of you and the friends, how good you have been. How wonderful the work, and how inspiring of the work that you have been. I hope, I hope that you can get it as much done as you possibly can for this. And then we'll come back for dances, and we'll come back for many more memories. And those little kids right there can have memories of what North Brookfield is. It has been a wonderful town to Steve Brewer, and I am deeply <coughs> grateful for your support.